Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss classical and modern jurisprudence. Today's episode features Lee J. Strang, the John W. Stepler Professor of Law and Values at University of Toledo College of Law. Professor Strang writes and teaches about originalism, constitutional law, property, and religion and the First Amendment. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. What is jurisprudence? Are there different answers to that question or different ways of thinking about it? Jurisprudence is, I think, the more old-fashioned way of what today most people describe as law and philosophy. And so if you think of the etymology of jurisprudence, it has two, two parts to it. One is juris, which deals with law, and then prudentia, which deals with science or, or knowledge. And so jurisprudence is the study or the science of law. And, and I think today uh, people use it synonymously with the philosophy of law. And in the Anglo-American world, what people uh, who teach, who study, who write in jurisprudence or law and philosophy, what they're doing is they're trying to evaluate not any particular jurisdiction's law, but the nature of law more generally, trying to tease out what are, what are the key aspects, what distinguishes law, for example, from ethics or law from uh, a game. And I think also uh, in jurisprudence and philosophy of law, people are looking to identify what are the key aspects of law. Uh, for example, it's positivity, the fact that, that humans write it down, that, that humans uh, uh, put it on paper, put it in stone tablets. Uh, law's normativity, why is it that people in a jurisdiction tend to think, and in the United States as an example, almost all of us think that we should follow what the Constitution says. And so jurisprudence is the study of those uh, important characteristics of law. I think it's fair to say that there are two, and this is a, a generalization, there are two uh, basic approaches to the philosophy of law in the Anglo-American world. Uh, the first, and the one that I think is probably most prominent, is what is typically goes by the name of legal positivism. In legal positivism, uh, there's lots of different versions of it, there's lots of debates about, about what it is, but one of the core distinguishing characteristics, both by its proponents and by people who don't define themselves as legal positivists, is that they claim that one can identify uh, a legal system generally, and law in particular, without reference to ethics or law. Now that's not to say that all legal positivists hold exactly what I, that position that I said, that some legal positivists are called inclusive legal positivists, where they say that one identifies what the law is without reference to morality. For example, they would reference a, a source of law, so a law is something that comes from a legislature or a court or an executive branch, but that these inclusive legal positivists would say that th those sources of law and the laws themselves may then require legal officials to reference ethics as a way to decide how to, uh, for example, adjudicate a case. And I think an example from a legal positivist perspective might be the Eighth Amendment's Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. So the original meaning of cruel, uh, this is from the scholarship of John Stiniford, is disproportionate to the crime. And so that, that's, that's the positive law referencing an ethical standard, and it's an order to, for example, judges when a person who's subject to a crime alleges a violation of that clause to make a ethical slash legal judgment, so both ethical and legal at the same time. But the key point is that the Eighth Amendment is the Eighth Amendment not because of morality, but because it was passed by the Framing and Ratification Convention. So it's still a, that's still a legal positivist perspective. On the other side, in the Anglo-American world, is the natural law tradition. The natural law tradition go goes back to Aristotle. Uh, I think the most prominent proponent, the person who kind of put it in the package that uh, it's, it's his successors today look at is Thomas Aquinas. And the natural law perspective, I think, would agree with uh, what I had described uh, of the legal positivist position, which is that one can identify human law without necessarily resort to ethics or morality, and agree with that, but then make the additional claim that that's not all there is to the law, to law or the legal system. Uh, so for example, what a natural lawyer would, would argue, and this is something that John Finnis, I think, most prominently has done in the Anglo-American world, is he's argued that when you're looking at law, that one can say uh, two things about any given law. One can say that within a given legal system, is this law intrasystemically valid? Is it a law that came from Congress or the judicial branch or the executive branch? And that's so far consistent with the legal positivist proposition that I had articulated earlier. But at the same time, and this is where the natural lawyer would go further than the legal positivist, is that the natural lawyers could, would say that one of the capacities, one of the aspects of a legal system is 
the fact that the people in that legal system view the law as having a claim on them, them, as providing reasons for them to act in certain ways or to not act in other ways. And that that normativity of law is something the natural lawyer would say that legal positivists can't explain or have a difficult time explaining, but that natural lawyers explain it by identifying a second characteristic of law, which is to the, the extent to which the law, in fact, contributes to the common good of the community. And to the degree that it does so, then it's a full version, of what, what Finnis calls a focal case of law. And to the extent that it doesn't do that, then it's, it's, it's a marginal case. It's actually a, a deviated form. And maybe, maybe even, in fact, something that purports to be law, but in fact is so unjust, although it has the uh, right source, but it's something that, in fact, provides no reasons for the citizens in that community to act. And so the natural law tradition identifies laws, positivity as being an important necessary condition of law, but not the only condition of law, and that, in fact, the ability of that law to provide for justice and the common good is an additional component of that. What kind of questions does jurisprudence explore? How do legal positivists and natural law proponents think about the characteristics of the law? Jurisprudence in the Anglo-American world, its goal is to be able to, on the one hand, identify what this phenomenon of law is, and on the second hand, identify the characteristics of the phenomenon of law. And the reason why both of those are actually challenging, because most of us, I think, we know law when we see it, but it's actually hard in many ways to distinguish law from analogous ways that human beings cooperate with each other. So think of the system of ethics. Ethics, like law, seems to say, here's some things you should do, here's some things that you shouldn't do. Ethics, like law, uh, is not something that we necessarily choose ourselves. I don't choose the, the proposition that it's wrong to steal. I don't choose the proposition that it's wrong to go above 55 miles an hour. And so how is it that law is different than ethics? The second question that jurisprudence and legal philosophy look to is, what are the key characteristics that then define law? For most people in the Anglo-American world, they look at law in general as having a couple of characteristics. One is that uh, it comes from, from certain sources. Uh, so, so in our legal system, in the United Kingdom's legal system, in the Japanese legal system, there are certain people in a community, certain institutions in a political community that are authorized to create legal norms. Uh, the, these, 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 these rules, these principles, they, they, they tell people what to do, they tell people what not to do. And, and we recognize them as law because they come from institutions in the community who are labeled as, who are recognized as lawmaking institutions. So there's a source of this law. This law is posited, it's, it's written down typically in, in, the, in the Western legal tradition, it's actually literally written down uh, somewhere. And, and here's, here's the, the other important characteristic, that people follow it. It gives people a reason to act in a certain way or to not act in a certain way. And so, so let's think about ethics and then let's think about law. So, so thinking about kind of an analogous system uh, of a family. Let's say that you, you have a family and that you have a child and the child wants to take a bike ride go to the general store, buy some candy, and that, and that the mom in the family says that, that, that the goal is a good goal, um, but the route that the child wants to take is not the ideal route. Maybe, maybe it's too dangerous, maybe there's cars, maybe there's not enough of a shoulder. And so the mother says to the child, hey, it's great to go to the general store, but you need to take this other route, which is shorter, safer, fewer cars. And in the child's mind, the mother's instructions, the mother's law, isn't just another consideration for the child to take into account, it's what legal philosophers call an exclusionary reason, that the child now has to take on board the mother's instructions, the mother's law, and exclude the child's previous reasons for taking the route the child had initially wanted to take, the unsafe route. Now, going back to law, that even if, for example, you think that 55 miles an hour isn't the right speed limit, that in your mind what the law is instructing you to do is to say, when I set the cruise control, I'm gonna set 55 miles an hour because the law gave me an exclusionary reason. It's excluding the other reasons I had to go other than 55, like I wanna to get to my destination earlier, and, and, the, and instructed me to travel at just 55 miles an hour. And so law's normativity is, is the second major component of what legal philosophers uh, try to try to, to deal with. And in different schools of legal philosophy try, uh, address that issue uh, separately. And, uh, and, the, and those two schools of thought are the legal positivist school and the natural law school. And the legal positivist school actually has a number of different ways of looking at that. Some legal positivists will say that legal positivism's project is to not address the normativity of law. And one of the points that natural lawyers make 
is that that's actually a failure of the legal positivist position because, as I argued earlier, one of the things that we recognize as being a key aspect of law is its ability to give us reasons for action that exclude our own reasons for action that we should, we think we should, follow. Reasons for action sounds like ethics, which you talked about a little bit. Is law separable or inseparable from morality? In my view, law and morality are separate in one way, but not separate in another way. The natural attrition is able to identify there are things that are called law that one can identify without necessarily resorting to morality. That I know a statute passed by Congress in the, in the statutes at large is a part of the laws of the United States, not because I think it's just or unjust, efficient or inefficient, but simply because Congress passed it, the president signed it, and it's in the book called The Statutes at Large. And as a natural lawyer, I can recognize that intrasystemically, that statute in The Statute at Large is a federal law, one that presumptively, although I'm gonna argue defeasibly, one should follow. Now, there's the second part of the natural law uh, perspective on positive law, which is that even if I can recognize that a, that a given law is a law within that system, that doesn't mean that it has the full characteristics of law. The most famous definition of law in the natural law tradition comes from St. Thomas Aquinas. He said that law is an ordinance of reason for the common good and promulgated by him who has care of the community. And so the example that I gave of Congress, the authority, uh, promulgating a statute, Congress has care of the community, uh, and then there's a question of, is it for the common good? Now, I think all of us would agree that there are probably laws, statutes, judicial decisions that purport to be for the common good, but for different reasons, we might think that they aren't, in fact, for the common good. So you could imagine, for example, Congress passing a statute at the behest of uh, farm state senators. Right? So the farm state senators, they get together, uh, and through log rolling and other legislative mechanisms, they pass a statute that advantages farmers at, uh, to, to, the, to the disadvantage of non-farmers in the United States. Now, it might still conceivably be part of some broader conception of the common good, but, but putting aside that possibility, that might be an example of what we call uh, special interest legislation and that's targeted not for the common good of the entire American community, but just one subset of the American community. So even though we would recognize that that statute, which benefits American farmers at the expense of non-farmers, is in fact a statute in the United States, we might say that it's not in the focal case. It's not actually the paradigm example of what law is because it's not actually for the good of the entire American community. And there are lots of other ways in which a, in which a law could fall outside of the paradigm or focal case of the entire American community. Now, let's say that there was a law that we thought was validly passed by Congress, signed by the president in the statutes at large, or there was a decision issued by the Supreme Court, uh, signed by the clerk of the court. Everybody recognized that it is actually a decision of the Supreme Court and therefore uh, is, a, is, a law, is a valid law intrasystemically. Now, the, in the natural tradition, because those laws are presumptively laws that we should follow, but they're defeasible. And what that means is there can be conditions under which one shouldn't follow those laws. And uh, a classic example given by Thomas Aquinas from the ancient world was uh, if, uh, if the emperor had required one to burn incense to an idol of the emperor. Uh, what, what Aquinas argued was that that was requiring one to affirmatively do something that was unethical. And so the presumptive obligatoriness of the emperor's laws, which in the Roman Empire, the emperor was the lawgiver, and Aquinas would agree that presumptively the emperor's laws were, were laws that one should follow. Because uh, the, the emperor had required one to do something that was unethical, deeply unethical in Aquinas's view, th that law lost uh, its, its obligatoriness, that, that it had become defeased. Uh, and so similarly in the United States, you could have laws that because of their deep injustice or because they require one to do something that's unjust, uh, in fact, their obligatoriness uh, uh, ceases and one is not required to follow them. I want to make sure to be clear that even if a particular law loses its, ob its obligatoriness on us because of, let's say, its injustice or requires us to perform an unjust act, there could be other reasons given by the legal system for which we would still follow that law. Um, so you could imagine, so let's say that there is a, a court decision and that, and that you think the court decision is slightly erroneous, that you believe it is slightly beyond the authority of the law uh, for the judges to issue that decision. And so therefore, it seems like uh, its, its prima facie obligatoriness uh, might be defeased. But at the same time, you think that the overall legal system is basically just. 
It's allowing most people in that community to pursue the common good. It's securing, for the most part, justice, both distributive and community justice. Uh, it's allowing people to live decent human lives. Uh, people are treated with respect, they're treated with equal dignity. In that situation, the legal system itself gives one a reason to follow that, that decision, which by hypothesis you think is unjust, because uh, the legal system itself provides so much value, not just to you as an individual, but to your, to your fellow community members. And, and, and knowing the good that comes to, from the legal system to your fellow community members is itself a strong reason to follow even a law where one would not otherwise have to follow that law. And I, I think that's actually the situation that most of us fall into most of the time. That to the extent that you think that the American legal system is basically just, that it provides for the rule of law, that it provides for distributive justice and commutative justice, it allows most Americans to live decent human lives, then if Congress passes a statute, if the executive issues an order, if the judiciary issues a decision that doesn't require one to perform an affirmatively unjust act, then I think the legal system itself, the American legal system itself, provides strong reasons to continue the process of the legal system, then work within the legal system to try to rectify the unjust decision, the unjust executive order, or the unjust statute. So if natural law dictates a higher order of justice than positive law, does natural law permit people to take the positive law into their own hands? The natural law tradition's position on positive law is that it, there can be a law that's interest systemically valid. It's, it's, it comes from the appropriate source, it's got the appropriate signatures on it, it's in the, it's in the right book, but because of, of some characteristic, it lacks full obligatoriness on the citizens of that community. Maybe it's only uh, pursuing the, the good of some subset of the community at the expense of the rest of the community. I think the natural law tradition's position is that a person should, for the most part, continue to follow the law, even if that particular law does not have all of the characteristics of the focal case of law, because of the great good that the legal system overall provides to the citizens of that community. But one might argue in response that that authorizes each person to become a law unto him or herself. I think there's two ways to think about that. Uh, so one way is empirical. In fact, is it the case that, that Americans if when they face an, uh, what they perceive as an unjust law, don't follow that law. And I think there is some of that, actually. Um, there are some situations where uh, Americans uh, perceive a judicial decision, a statute by Congress, an action by the president as so egregious that, that, that they're willing to put aside the great goods of the legal system and the rule of law in order to challenge and attack that particular law's injustice. And, and I'm honestly of two minds about that. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I think it's actually healthy to have uh, mechanisms for citizens to publicly push back against uh, laws that are intrasystemically valid, but that for other reasons in particular of justice, those citizens think uh, aren't correct. Uh, and there's classic examples of this throughout American history. So prior to the Civil War, you had abolitionists. There were laws that were, that were, that were legally valid, uh, validly passed by Congress, uh, like the, uh, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which required uh, actions by, by people uh, who were abolitionists, people in, in the free states, to participate in the repatriation of alleged slaves back into servitude and bondage. And, and so that law was uh, systemically valid, but it also required one to, to act in a way that by their lights and by my lights uh, would require them to perpetuate an injustice. And, and so I think in those situations when uh, those abolitionists acted against uh, those laws, either through passive resistance or in some cases even through active resistance, that doing so was probably a healthy aspect of the legal system. Now, not, not that there weren't negative consequences, because I think one of the negative consequences uh, of when one citizen or one group of citizens or one perspective in the citizenry uh, starts to not follow the law is that there can be a vicious cycle of other people of other perspectives and other groups also not following the law. And you arguably saw that in the antebellum era where there became an ever more heated dispute. Uh, bloody Kansas would be an example of that. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that actually uh, having some uh, citizen pushback, uh, uh, d despite the value of the, of the legal system generally, is probably healthy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it is the case that uh, the American legal system uh, provides tremendous values to, to us as Americans. And, and I think this really uh, struck home with me uh, during the second impeachment of President Trump. And this might be a counterintuitive example. So when you think about uh, the impeachment, uh, the second and the first impeachments of President Trump, 
what you had was uh, Americans then, Americans today, deeply divided about whether those impeachments were legal, whether they were just. And, and despite those deep divisions, despite uh, people being very critical of the president, despite people being supportive of the president, and therefore critical of the critics of the president, that the legal system provided a public, provided a, a, a thoughtful, uh, provided a nonviolent mechanism for critics of the president, the most powerful person in the world, to be able to articulate that criticism and then present that criticism to the citizens, citizens generally. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an example of the value of the rule of law, and, and we don't want to lose that. So, so there's not a clear point at which it, at the ability of citizens to, to, to not follow the law uh, ceases being valuable and instead starts to undermine the entire system. But, but I think that, that those, are, those, are two, uh, those are two coexisting uh, phenomenon that are, that are both healthy. On the one hand, citizens, uh, to some degree and in some instances, pushing back against especially egregious unjust laws that are valid within the legal system. And then at the same time, the tremendous value of the rule of law in our legal system that, that the Constitution provides us. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on jurisprudence. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.